thank you for the introduction and welcome from my side as well. As you can see in the title, I will present some findings on the intricates of mechanical testing. So what was the aim of this work? The major goal of this investigation was to find out if you can compare the strength results of the ball and free balls and the ring on ring test. And also we wanted to know how friction and how an uneven loading might influence the strength results. So in order to answer these questions, let's start with the testing methods. And as the name already implies, the ball and free balls test uses three supporting balls and a single loading ball, and it applies a biaxial stress field with a typical threefold symmetry in the specimen. And in comparison, the ring and ring test utilizes two coaxial rings and applies a fully rotationally symmetric stress field. And you can see that there is a large difference in the size of the maximum stress region between the two methods, which will have quite a big influence on the measured strength. So how do we actually compare the two methods? And according to viable theory, there's a relationship between the effective volume and the characteristic strength, which is commonly known as the size effect. And in theory, samples exhibit a lower strength with an increase in effective volume, as you can see here. And if this graph is displayed on a double logarithmic scale, then the slope of a linear fit through all data points can be used to calculate the fitted viable modulus. So if the fitted viable modulus and the viable moduli of each set are about equal, then they follow the formula up here. And this means that each result of one method can be converted to result of the other method. And just as a note, in our case, the failure was determined by surface flaws. So instead of the effective volume, we use the effective surface, but the same principle still applies. So a speciality of the ring and ring test is that usually some sort of intermediate layers or lubricants have to be used. And their main purpose is to reduce friction and they're usually utilized on both sample sites. So for our work, we used commer commercially available alumina with three different intermediate layers. So we used an adhesive teflon tape and an adhesive polyethylene tape. And both of them were only applied on the compression loaded side in order to have as little influence on the strength results as possible. And that's why they were always used in combination with a loose Teflon foil for the tension loaded side. And in the following results, you will see different endings for various data set names with the ending T referring to use of Teflon tape and BT to the use of polyethylene tape. And if neither of them appear, then the sample is tested without any layers. So let's have a look at the results and see if we can actually compare the two methods. So here you can see the viable parameters for each data set on the left, and here are the characteristic strengths in dependence of the effective surface to the right. And you can clearly see the difference in effective surface between the two methods over here, which is about two orders of a magnitude. And now if we fit this data, we can see that if the fitted viable models of about 30, that it is in very good agreement with most of the single viable sets over here. But there were two data sets that were not taken into account for the fit. So the first one is a ball and free ball set that was tested with a compliant layer and which shows quite a high strength compared to other ball and free ball samples. And the other one is a ring on ring sample that was tested without any layers, which is both lacking in strength and viable models. So in order to explain the high strength of ball and free ball samples with layers, we have to look at how the maximum stress is calculated. And we can see here that the factor F plays a very important role as the only other variables are the load P and the specimen's thickness T. Now, if we look at the factor F in dependence of the contact radius, we can see that if the contact radius increases, like it would be when testing with soft intermediate layers, then F decreases. So now in order to achieve the same stress, the load has to increase to compensate the decrease in F. But if we still use the factor F for an ideal point less load when calculating fracture strength, then the increased load leads to a seemingly higher strength, which explains the observed results. So now we still have to explain the low strength of ring and ring samples that were tested without any layers. And for that, we have to look at the problem with finite element analysis. 
So our first intention was that friction, which should be increased when no layers are present, lowers the measured strength. And to validate this idea, we used a two-dimensional model, which corresponds to the tested samples with varying friction coefficients. So now you can see the formation of stress and the deformation during testing. So instead of applying a load directly on the sample, a displacement was applied on the model of the loading ring over here, which then in turn loaded the specimen. So let's have a look at the stress of the tensor surface. And here you can see the graph of the radial stress components for varying friction coefficients. And the most important findings are a general decrease in stress and the formation of stress concentrations near the loading ring. So since the stress decreases, this would mean that a higher apparent strength should be measured, which sadly is the exact opposite of what we observed. So friction could not explain the decrease in strength, and we had to look at other explanations. And one possible explanation might be uneven loading. So due to the lack of layers, small misalignment and machine inaccuracies between the ring and the specimen might not be compensated. And this could lead to a decrease in strength. So we used finite element analysis again, but this time with a very simple three-dimensional model. And as before, the model corresponds to the tested samples but this time friction was not taken into account. And to further simplify the problem, instead of contact calculations, like in the previous model, a cosine shaped load was applied to simulate multiple contacts. So these images show the stress field for the ideal case. And this is the result for five contacts. And I think it's pretty clear to see that zones of higher stress at the simulated contact regions appear. And so again, we'll take a closer look at the stress of the tensor surface, but this term through the zones of increased stress down here. And in these results, we can observe a significant stress increase at or very close to loading wind radius. And if the number of contact points is increased, then the ideal case will be approached. Now, if this is true and stress maxima like this occur at the loading ring, then a high number of fracture origins should be found in these regions. And after doing a lot of photography, a significant difference was actually observed. So we can see here that if no layers used, the number of fracture origins in the central region decreases and they can be found in or very close to the contact zones instead. So all of this points in the right direction, but the previous model just assumes a certain load distribution. So we investigated the ring surface in more detail and as you can see, there's a certain waviness to it. So once again, a simulation was conducted, but this time with a full three-dimensional contact model of the whole testing assembly. And for this model, the surface of the loading ring was modified to represent a small waviness with an amplitude of five micrometers. And it turned out that even for waviness this small and only three contact points, full contact will not be achieved. And if we look at the change in contact stress throughout the test, we can see that our assumption in the previous model was quite close. And the main difference would be the pointier shape of the stress distribution in the contact regions. So let's go back to the three questions from the beginning. So first, is it possible to compare the results? And I would say it is possible as long as the material behaves according to Weibel theory and when some care is taken into account when testing with intermediate layers. So keep in mind that ball for balls results with layers generate overestimate the strength and that ring on ring result without intermediate layers underestimate the strength. Then how does the friction influence the measured strength? Well, if friction is taken into account, a general decrease in stress was observed, which then in turn led to an apparent increase in strength. And finally, how does uneven loading influence the measured strength? And as we now know, uneven loading results in zones of significantly increased stress, which therefore decrease the strength. So closing up, I want to thank Tanja Lube, Peter Supancic, and Josef Schlacher for working with me on this project, as well as the Austrian government for financing this work. And I hope you enjoyed this little trip to the heart of mechanical Thank you very much, um, Mr. Staudacher, for your nice talk.
Um, any questions um, from my colleagues? No? Excuse me, I, I couldn't hear the first thing you said, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. And I wanted to ask um, questions, um, if there are any questions on the audience. I have one from the, um, here we have FNA here. Um, so there's a question from the audience. Do you observe less grain growth? No, that, um, that's not the um, correct talk. Um, so here we have another one. Um, I can't see the questions, I think. Oh, here, here, sorry. Charlie. No, but that's still... Um, hello, yeah, I have one question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, why do you use the effective surface, not the effective volume to, uh, I think for one resource you have shown there's this, yeah, exact, ah. Uh, yeah. So but I think that is the effective surface you have used, right? The we results used, you've shown us. The results we've shown were with the effective surface because after doing photography, we saw that the failure was only determined by the surface flaws. So that's, but the, the results for the effective volume look pretty much the same. So it doesn't, we observe the same results, but I think it's better if we use the effective surface because all major flaws were from there. So that's just a concept okay. over here. And then for the actual testing, we use the effective surface. Okay. And the other question is the, how did you calculate the effective surface? You have also used the finite element simulation, right? Yeah, exactly. So at our institute, we have quite a lot of finite elements of an analysis with all kinds of different geometries and where they calculated the effective surface. And then we used an interpolation of those calculations to in order to determine the effective surface for these results. And so I think it was a third order interpolation in Wolfram Alpha in Mathematica. Okay, yeah, thank you. There is one question from the audience. From yes, Dr. Dr. Langhoff. Langhoff. What can you do to prevent the uneven load of the ROR setup? Yeah, so the major, the easiest part would be to better machine the ring very, very carefully and polish the ring. And the main thing that's also in the standard is just to use intermediate layers. But you have to be a little bit careful with intermediate layers because we observed some fracture at, at higher forces. So if you, if you look here, you can see that there's not all layers behave the same. So you have to be a little bit careful, but I think the easiest is just to use proper layers and proper machining for the ring. Okay, thank you. We have one last question from Dr. Langhoff. Okay. This was my question. Uh, <laughs> already discussed, yeah. Okay, thank Maybe. you. Okay, thank you. If there are no more, actually, we are running out of time. So thank you very much again, um, Mr. Staudacham. And um, 